Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm assuming we're all in the afternoon now. Uh, my name is Nompilo Chuma, and I'm at Rhodes University in South Africa. Um, thank you for joining the session today. It promises to be an exciting session. I'm sure we all have questions. Um, let's keep our questions on hand. We're going to ask them as the session progresses. Um, it would be great if we know each other. So if you can just type in the comment box and let us know where you're joining us from, that would be great so that at least the presenters have an idea of uh, where everyone is located. Okay, so our presentation today is uh, MOOC making and changing educator practices. Um, Catherine is joining us from sunny Cape Town. It's sunny today. It was raining yesterday. Uh, Jamie is in Cape Town. Welcome. Irene is joining us from Nairobi in Kenya. Carl from Cape Town. Tony is in Cape Town as well. Ishai is in Nigeria. Welcome everybody and thanks for making the time. Chisoni, University of Zambia. And welcome, Nicola, in Cape Town. Um, I see we also have Olufemi um, and Carl. Please let us know where you are joining us from. OK, in the meantime, I'll go ahead and um, introduce our presenters so that um, we don't take up too much of their time. We have um, Sukina Walji. And she is located at the University of Cape Town in their Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching. Um, she's the project manager for the SILT MOOC implementation team and the communications advisor for the research in open educational resources for development in the global south. Um, we're looking forward to uh, this presentation, which is based I'm assuming on their impact study project on OER MOOCs. Um, I haven't seen Andrew yet, who is the other presenter, and I hope he is trying to connect as we speak. Um, Andrew works on course and curriculum development project, also in the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching at UCT. And his current work focuses on learning analytics, learning design, large-scale assessments, and MOOCs. OK. Um, oh, Andrew is there with you. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, welcome to the presenters. And without further ado, I will hand over to you now. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, really good to be here. Um, thank you very much, Nompido, for that lovely introduction. Um, yes, Andrew and I are sitting in the same office, um, and we will um, share, the, share the presentation with you today. So uh, really good to see um, some uh, old friends and new friends. Um, and uh, we're going to talk through the presentation, but if you have any questions, one of us will be monitoring the chat. And we are very happy to um, respond to questions as we go through. So we'll keep an eye on that. OK. So I'm just going to make sure I can move the slides along. Um, OK. So who, who we are, um, or who are we, on this particular research project? Um, so as Nompilo said, we're going to be mainly reporting on a project that is part of the Wolfe-D impact studies which has been around researching um, open educational resources in MOOCs and the inf influence of those on educators' practices. And so the project team comprises of four of us, Laura Chernovitz, Andrew Deacon, Michael Glover, and myself. And we are at the final stages of this project where we are writing up. So it's been very useful to uh, think through this presentation. So we're the MOOC team at SILT at the University of Cape Town. We're also learning designers and researchers who are looking particularly at MOOCs. So we have some, well, massive questions, I suppose. These are big, big questions. And some, some of us, we hope, um, 
well, we hope that some of these will, um, our research will shine some light on these. So some of the questions that we'll be looking at, we'd really like you to think about these questions as well, so perhaps we can stimulate the discussion, is why do educators make MOOCs um, in the first place? Um, what is different in educators' interest to make local African MOOCs, um, if, if there is anything different? Um, what do educators learn about open education um, as a result of interacting with or making MOOCs? Um, we're also interested, or do you still have sound? I can just see a note there if anyone can just type into the chat. I'll just wait until I get um, confirmation. Okay, all right. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and we're also interested in how do educators' educational practices shift? How can lecturers or educators be supported to become more open? And how educators and others are using their MOOCs? And just to clarify here that our perspective is from the perspective of researchers and also learning designers who are working with lecturers and educators. So I just wanted to be clear about that. So we have um, a, a sort of production and a research strand um, going on. So we have a project at UCT which is creating 12 MOOCs over three years. Um, and we are in the third year of that project. And we also have had one particular research project uh, which has been funded by the Wolf D project, which is to research education's open educational practices. And we'll unpack some of those terms um, soon. So these are um, some of the MOOCs that we have produced so far at the University of Cape Town. We've got 10 um, and counting. We've got a, um, another three in production at the moment, so we will end up with 13. Um, and so we've got quite a lot of um, a very, very interesting experiences, a lot, uh, quite a lot of data, lots more questions about what all this means for um, higher education, for educational provision, for teaching and learning. Um, it's been a very, very exciting space. And the project or, um, has allowed us to really do some reflective thinking around our own practices. Um, the research project that we'll be reporting on has focused on four of the courses, which are highlighted there. Um, and that's just because of the, the timing of the grant and when we had to finish. Um, but we will bring in a few other snippets from some of the other projects that also resonate with our findings. So just to kind of forecast what's coming up, um, we looked at MOOC educators, open educational practices, um, along three main dimensions. And we'll continue to unpack these dimensions. But just to say that um, please bear in mind whether these dimensions make sense to you um, in your practice or whether um, there's something interesting that resonates with you when we talk through them. So the, f the first one is what we've called legal openness, which is the kind of practice or understanding where one has expertise on copyright and OER, open education resources. Um, and whether that's something that um, it's a dimension that we we discovered, but we also discovered something quite interesting about it, that even though this manifested in the project, it wasn't something that the educators were particularly interested in as a, as a practice themselves. Um, our second dimension is pedagogical openness, and this is quite broad, but we've defined it to as under, as the kinds of new pedagogical strategies that were adopted when teaching on the MOOC and often used beyond the MOOC. And then we have a very interesting dimension that, that came up, which was we've called we've referred to as financial openness. And this is the practice that led educators to engage with MOOC business models, which was a kind of new type of practice which interacted with their own approaches to teaching and the way that they worked um, in open spaces. So I just wanted to, to um, signal that, that that's uh, what's coming. Um, I thought it would be quite useful just to very quickly recap some of the key terms from the literature. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar um, with most of these, but just to say um, our, our definition of MOOCs or Massive Open Online Courses um, is 
a form of online learning um, that enables mass participation, has no formal entry requirements. So these are the types of courses that are not formal, full credit courses. Um, you will find MOOCs all over the place now, but uh, most well known, I suppose, on these very large MOOC platforms such as Coursera or edX or FutureLearn or Canvas. And they have tended to be free entry, no prior requirements required, very large classes. They're known for um, high dropout rate. It's a different form of online learning. Um, open education resources, and another term, um, a, a movement, is, if you will, which are around teaching and learning resources that are licensed for reuse, remixing, repurposing, and usually released under a Creative Commons license. And then a term that um, is increasingly um, uh, used uh, in relation to uh, open the open education movement and attached to OER, and that's Open Educational Practices, OEP. And these are actions, practices, strategies that include the adoption of OER, what can you do with OER, but also a broader set of what might be termed open pedagogies, open learning and sharing practices. And that's been the kind of um, area of interest for us. You know, what are, what happens to educators' open educational practices when they um, make MOOCs? And I've just shared this slide here, um, which is from a presentation I did at um, OER 17 earlier this year. And it was just a way of um, illustrating that the literature around OER and OEP um, it has developed over time um, and it's quite contested um, in the sense that there's quite a lot of definitions of what constitutes OEP and open pedagogy. And the point I just wanted to make here is that our um, idea was to make a contribution to understandings of what are open education practices um, in a particular context of um, making MOOCs. So as I said, it's an evolving concept in open education. Um, and um, the, the second um, reference there from Catherine Cronin, um, we found quite useful, which was really around differentiating practices which rely particularly on using OER and very legal focused definitions of open practices, but also some broader conceptions of practices which incorporate OER, but also include um, other types of um, teaching and learning activities. And so that's why that's why we were interested in this study as relates to MOOC making, which is um, fairly under-researched. Um, for our study, we drew um, on quite a lot of the OEP literature, um, and we took two frameworks, one by Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams um, in a paper from 2014, where she identified five particular features of open practices, technical, legal, cultural, pedagogical and financial, and then from Helen Beetham and colleagues, where she also identified particular um, practices that are catalyzed by OER, and, and you can see them there. And what we did was we um, drew on those for our own um, uh, conceptual framework in our study. So in this presentation, for when we describe the findings and what we found, we drew on three sources. So the first of all is the study that, that we're talking about. And we've also drawn on our course evaluations and tracking of our impacts through our monitoring and evaluation strategy, with, which Andrew oversees. And that goes across all of the MOOCs that we are developing. And we're also um, drawing on our own experiences of being learning designers, working with academics who are making MOOCs. And that's been quite a powerful um, and reflective experience. So in our study, um, we had a, quite a, our main question was how does MOOC making with OER adoption influence educators' OEP? And we had a, quite a few sub-questions, and the ones that I've highlighted there are ones that we're going to touch on, um, primarily around why do educators create MOOCs, what are the contextual dimensions which shape the OEP, and then looking at the three dimensions I mentioned right at the beginning, which were how do educators understand and express copyright, licenses, and legal dimensions? How do educators use and reuse OER beyond the MOOC, which is um, related to legal um, practices? 
How is pedagogical openness experienced? And then how is financial openness experienced? Um, our methodology um, was um, um, we had semi-structured interviews with MOOC educators and their broader teams and some focus groups. And then we also um, analyzed um, through observation of the MOOC making process. We, and we bolstered that with um, looking at artifacts such as the proposals that the MOOC educators developed for making MOOCs um, and then various other uh, monitoring and evaluation reports, videos, um, and actual course content. So we had quite a rich data set. And our framework, our analytical framework that we developed, which um, emerged from the first set of data analysis, was that we found these three particular dimensions being manifested, legal openness, pedagogical openness, and financial openness. And we'll talk about that now, and I'll hand over to Andrew. But if there's any questions in the meantime, I'll look out in the um, chat. Hi, I'm Andrew. Um, and so I'll run through starting with um, the um, the legal openness. Um, and so we, but before we get there, um, there's a, a a big question of why educators create um, So we had four courses that we looked at, and Two of them sort of were, um, in, in two cases, the educators were very keen. The reason why they wanted to create a MOOC was to grow their field. And so they would, um, uh, um, uh, they were very keen to have people join the MOOC who would help them grow their field and make it um, more visible. And, and for example, one of this was in the medical humanities field where that this was an emerging field and there were a lot of students at the university who they wanted to get involved and interested in the topic and this was their motivation for creating the MOOC and this drove a lot of their enthusiasm and interest. Um, in, in two other cases we had people um, who were very keen to uh, um, help uh, uh, people get uh, additional qualifications that you couldn't get through the normal um, university courses um, and this was, for example, in, in medical fields, and and and, and, the, um, and these really drove people in in different, slightly different directions. Um, okay. Um, the, the, the in some cases, people were using the, the courses afterwards for for their own teaching. Um, and in other cases, they were using them um, to create a community or, or building a community. And this, and what we saw in this, was largely driven by their different starting assumptions, um, and also how they used open and, and OER in the context. So, um, legal openness is one of those. Um, difficult for educators to grasp if they had done all their teaching within the university. Often somebody can lecture and teach a course without considering legal openness because all their students are within the university and they have access through the library to resources that people in the general public don't. When one's creating a MOOC, one has to consider creating openly licensed material that will be accessible to anybody anywhere in the world. Um, and ideally, this should have a Creative Commons license. Um, and the, uh, But it has to be licensed in a way that, um, uh, th 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 that we can reuse it and share it without um, being challenged. And educators didn't particularly um, like uh, the process of of obtaining the uh, re the legal releases of of documents, and what we were doing was doing a lot of that work for people. So the design team had to think of the copyright implications and use, and we were the mediators in this process. Um, and there were where things were licensed. There were a number of cases where this, in fact, allowed people to reuse it. Um, 
beyond their course, either share it with uh, colleagues, uh, use it in their own teaching, um, uh, uh, discover much later that people had used it in, um, in, in contexts that they had not anticipated. And so this was actually turned out to be quite a surprise. So we've got a few quotes here um, that, that people hadn't anticipated these, but, but they, it, you know, it turned out to be, a, a, um, a, 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 you know, they turned out to be, have a, a sort of impact. Um, so we had, uh, um, in all cases, we had openly licensed the material, uh, um, but the, the 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 people creating the courses were often very keen to share their own academic publications on the MOOCs as well, and and this is an example of something that's in many cases not possible, um, but there are ways around it, and we we did in some cases find other versions of their academic published texts to share um, and other ways of summarizing texts. So in, in most cases where there were barriers, there were ways around it. Um, and I don't know if any of you have had examples where this kind of legal openness has been a barrier for people um, wanting to share material, you know, both within the university and beyond the university. Uh, um, let's see if there are any comments. Mm -hmm. Not yet. No, no I think we, there's uh, nothing okay. in yeah. Because th th this idea that this um, that legal openness is something that one has to be aware of and sensitive to, but for which there is often very little support within the university, is uh, um, was quite a surprise to many of our educators. So now we're going to switch from a the perspective we've been looking at now has been very much looking at the at the materials and now we're going to look at the at the sort of pedagogy and this involves understanding not the uh, understanding who the audience of the MOOC are and, and, and now it's switched not from uh, teaching within your uh, your class within your university but teaching to a global audience. Um, here there was much, educators were much uh, uh, quicker at picking up what they needed to do to, to teach to a global audience and we had a lot of um, comments from the interviews that we did where people were, were very um, enthusiastic and stimulated by this opportunity to teach to a, a, a different audience and adapt their material appropriately. Um, and it often though was quite a challenge in the beginning, particularly in the video making or the video production to reorientate from a lecture to a, a, um, a an online MOOC format. Um, but, but this was for the most part people embraced this and we had uh, um, uh, people really um, saying very nice things about their experience in creating MOOCs and welcoming the opportunity. And this this really showed a shift in the, them becoming adopting more open educational practices, seeing the value of these, seeing it how it supported their own work, um, and seeing a shift in roles and a, a and playing multiple roles, um, and 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 seeing different ways of engaging with people. And, I, and again, I don't, don't know how many of you've um, seen, been working with people or experienced yourself, but seeing how um, having an opportunity to speak to a very different audience has um, changed your views on on open educational practices um, and created opportunities. Um, maybe we can just pick up on Jerome's question, um, which is, so what's the difference between this legal openness and the OER openness that we know? So, um, Jerome, it's 
it, it's a different way of saying the same thing in the sense that um, OER openness, I suppose by that you mean uh, creating OER and using open educational resources. I think perhaps when we say legal openness, um, we are referring to, yes, um, people understand OER and also how to use Creative Commons licenses, but also um, they understand the, the broader implications of perhaps not using Creative Commons licenses. So it's what what our argument, I suppose, is is that when making MOOCs, we found that whether people really wanted to or not, they had to engage with legal openness one way or the other. They had to make decisions around whether they would release their materials as um, open education resources or not. Um, in our case at the University of Cape Town, all our materials are released um, under a Creative Commons license, but that's not necessarily the case with um, all MOOCs at all. Um, so the idea is that um, as an educator, if you're making a MOOC, you have to engage with the prospect of um, and the implications of either releasing your materials um, openly or not. Um, and, 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 and as Andrew mentioned, um, the, the consequences of releasing openly were seen later on where educators were then able to see reuse happening, which was part of what they wanted happening. So that kind of, that all of their legal openness was sometimes reluctant and they needed a lot of support because they really didn't want to deal with the technical issues. Um, it was an, a dimension that in a way they were forced to um, engage, with, but also later on, and because we, our methodology was to interview people over time, we could see that the shift in the, in some ways their legal openness strengthened over time once they saw their materials either being reused or that they themselves were able to um, benefit from the reuse permissions that were um, enabled initially at production. So hopefully, um, Jerome, I don't know if that answers your question or if I understood it correctly. Yes, and, uh, um, and 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 in many cases we are uh, in the MOOCs. In this, in some cases, we are using copyrighted material as well, but with permission. And so it's not that the whole course is a, an OER. And and this was our one of our big questions was um, what is an OER, what is an OEP, and what is a MOOC? So what are how do we because there's a lot of overlap between um, open education resources, open educational practices, and massively open online courses, but they're not actually the same thing, and they emphasize different aspects of being open and sharing, and we, we were primarily interested in, in how they overlap and support each other, and this is what Sikana sort of introduced in the beginning, that these, by, by looking at MOOCs, and open educational practice and OER, we could um, see more clearly how these support each other and um, and don't support each other, and um, what people are interested in, what has a, 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 um, a, a, a um, you know, what kind of support is needed, etc. So that was underlying one of our our questions, and often when looking at OER only, one doesn't consider the, what we call here financial openness because the intention there is that everything would be free. But as soon as you've got um, um, as soon as the process of sharing, and, it's, and a MOOC is a good example of this, also has a, a business model implicit behind it, even if free access is part of it, um, there might be a paying option or a or a opportunity to buy a certificate or an opportunity to um, uh, 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 for an organization to pay for people to take the course um, understanding these business models is becomes really important if you would like to sustain or redesign later your your course or um, do something different and so th this is what we could um, do in, in our study, which isn't often done in a traditional OER study. Um, so, so this was the, 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 this financial openness appeared 
at, at, um, although we explained it at the start of the course, it, it, it made more sense once people had created their courses. So in our earlier interviews, this topic had um, showed a little insight of, of people, but once the course was over, people had a much clearer insight of, for example, the role of, of, of selling certificates. So the courses that we designed that had the, um, where people were trying to grow the field, that those that were associated with comparatively low sales of certificates and those which had very skills-based, had very high, uh, comparatively high certificate sales. And this is what MOOC platforms find in general, that they now tend to focus on skills um, um, courses because people do want a certificate to show that they've um, um, developed a skill. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, so the so there is are also concerns about this financial openness. If if you, it, it could be that um, a MOOC platform might make it very difficult to um, to for people to get access, force everybody to pay. For example, and this was one of our concerns as well because we were trying to make all our material CC licensed wherever possible. Um, and make sure that there were very few financial barriers to participation, but where people were prepared to pay, um, you know, design material, very supportive of those models. Um, and what's what's um, the, 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 what's happened from from the start of the project until now is that all the platforms have. Uh, which are Coursera and FutureLearn have tried to put uh, um, have tried to increase their revenue. Um, FutureLearn, for example, um, only gives free access while the course is running, and shortly after the course finishes, they require you to um, upgrade, um, which involves a payment to continue access to the material. And in Coursera, they generally charge for this. For the graded assessments um, and all the other material is is is, is freely accessible, um, and what emerged from our interviews with educators is they came up with quite creative ways of of either undermining or inverting this relationship or finding other ways of of um, of making sure that it was sustainable. So we had examples where one of the educators got funding for Coursera to create a new skills course. We, uh, most of the educators on Coursera um, were promoting the use of financial aid where um, one can guarantee um, to have access to the full course and get a certificate without paying. Um, and there were, uh, 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 so, and, and this created quite a lot of um, stimulation to see how one, uh, how, how educators would um, want to create courses that people really need and, and really valued um, through looking at the, the um, at, through understanding how the platforms function and how we as learning designers also function and what our uh, costs and time investing in these courses uh, is. Mm -hmm. So I might just pick up on a question from uh, another question from Jerome or a comment, I think, which relates to that. Um, so that uh, Jerome says the medical humanities, oh no, not that one. There was one about video. I'm just going to see if I can find it in the chat. Yes, Jerome, you said the level of technical expertise required for making the kinds of videos that were produced for the medical humanities course are not widely available um, in many institutions in Africa. I think you're probably referring to the medicine and the arts course. Yes, I mean, that is the the production costs of MOOCs, if done um, to the kind of standards or um, accepted standards of the large MOOC platforms, are not inconsiderable. Um, making videos is expensive. Uh, making high quality videos is even more expensive. And there's a whole continuum. And yes, we absolutely acknowledge that. Um, And um, in the case of that particular course and the, a funded project um, that was funded by the Vice-Chancellor's Strategic Fund, um, 
uh, and therefore there was funding available for that. Um, subsequently, uh, people have gone away if they wanted to make more MOOCs and raised funds either from funders or, as Andrew mentioned, uh, one of our educators um, was successful in getting a, a startup funding from Coursera as a contribution to making a MOOC. Um, so yes, that that can, that is a challenge. Um, however, having said that, and seeing the you know very large diversity of types of MOOCs that are being produced, um, it is possible to produce MOOCs with a different level of video quality. I think and we're see, certainly seeing that. Um, in, in, in many other MOOCs. So yes, uh, just acknowledging Jerome's um, point there about that. Um, yeah, I'm just going to, um, maybe we'll move on to, we'll just talk through some of the, the kind of concluding points because there's some really interesting discussion points which we'd really like to pick up on in the chat. But if I just maybe just go through perhaps the high, the high level um, sort of findings or conclusions. Um, is that we found that MOOC making um, was a stimulant for the emergence of open educational practices along legal, pedagogical, and financial openness dimensions. Um, and that we found that these dimensions were very useful for entry points into different types of perspectives. Um, so from you know a legal perspective, you can you can say that the 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 the, the lens is a kind of content or materials perspective um, as a type of OEP. Um, the pedagogical dimension was around um, focusing perhaps on learners and, and practices that allow teaching and learning to be more learner focused. And then the financial openness was really around looking at the institutional perspective of perhaps how and why could MOOCs be funded um, and, and looking at MOOC business models. And that was really interesting. Um, interestingly, practices seem to manifest most easily and first um, with pedagogical openness. It seemed to just be more natural um, for the educators to, to manifest these pedagogical types of practices. And this often then led to an appreciation of the power of OER um, rather than the other way around. Um, often in the OER literature, um, it's assumed that if people work with OER, then they become, they go to OEP as a result. We actually found different entry points um, that then led to OER, and that was quite interesting. Um, and the tech, one of the points that's been picked up in the group is around the technical expertise required to enable um, the legal openness, the you know, copyright and OER, and that we found that it has to exist somewhere in the broader team. Almost without question, the educators were really not very interested in becoming knowledgeable about copyright and OER. They appreciated the discussions and the possibilities, but they really did not want to um, get their hands dirty, particularly. And we, as a rep, we found that um, without this level of support for educators, it's, fair, it's unlikely that they would become, you know, OER advocates in the future. And that just finally, as we've mentioned, engagement with MOOC business models was a new type of practice that emerged. So that's that's pretty much our conclusions at this stage. Uh, maybe we can uh, either hand over back to you, um, non Pilo, or and I will also look through the chat um, if there are any questions. Uh, we'd love to hear about anybody else's experiences with making MOOCs and whether any of these um, dimensions or findings resonate with you. So thank you very much. Um, and we've just I got a slide there with recommendations. Hi everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, faintly. You're very faint, um, Nampira. Okay, I'll try and speak uh, that's better. Unfortunately, okay. I had to fine. change devices because the laptop, the, my sound uh, from the laptop just wasn't working, so I couldn't actually hear the presentation. Okay. Um, thank you so much for um, this engaging presentation. It's given all of us a lot to think about and the questions have been my first. Um, 
of questions that are similar. Question from Tony. Should we pick up on Tony's question? Um, which is, okay, I'll pick up on Tony's question. So Tony's saying, wondering, what helped these educators navigate the more difficult parts of the learning curve? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, well, what, one of our claims was that one had to look at what was motivating them to do the project in the first case. Um, and so the the... And, and this partly explains why they were keen to um, to look at the the, the pedagogical openness um, uh, first, um, and the, the, so the people who were motivated to um, develop their field um, were very keen and, and willing to explore and consider how they can get the material out. And so, for example, even this helped with the financial and the legal openness, and so they were very motivated to to um, find solutions to to challenges in those cases. I would say that's the that's the short answer to that response, without getting into some examples. I suppose the the practical elements were that they were this was a team effort. Um, you know, it takes a village to make a MOOC. Um, and so they were supported with um, learning designers and videographers. So, um, profession, you know, start, people they had resources who who assisted them throughout the process. And this this they have acknowledged was very important in the interviews as well that they appreciated that. And so, Jerome, your point there about as an individual lecture, it is difficult, if not impossible, to create a MOOC. It is very difficult, I think. Um, um, it obviously depends on uh, current experience, but yes, um, we what we have found is that people who have made a second MOOC or are thinking about um, doing MOOC-like things in the future, having made the first one, they are much more able to kind of um, think through what it takes. But yes, the first time uh, we had lots and lots of um, our lecturers saying to us. I had no idea how much work this was going to be. I did not know the many hundreds of hours that it took to decide how to encapsulate my 45 minute to one hour lecture into a 10 minute video. I didn't know how to do this. Um, so yes, it, it is a very large learning curve and um, support was in these cases provided. Um, having said that, there are many um, people in the MOOC world who are individuals who can create MOOCs in their basement um, with a video camera and a, a screen and they can put things together. Um, but they tend to be, um, you know, people who already have that expertise or are just willing to work extra, extra hard. I don't know if that, um, if you want to add anything more, Tony or Jerome, about those points. Yes, there's a, we've met people and uh, um, who've, who've done, as Sikenda said, who've made the whole course, and a very sophisticated course, is all by themselves. And, it's, and it's, uh, the, the video recording and editing um, uh, um, ability has, it, it, it has become much easier over the last few years, and so even a standard computer c can allow uh, an individual to pull together a very good um, videos, and th there are increasingly more people making their own courses. Um, what we were essentially doing, because uh, um, it's, it's relatively easy to... Um, Hire uh, you know hire people to do the video, the filming and the editing, um, because these are are um, skills that uh, now a lot of people have and a lot of um, uh, and uh, and the the MOOC making is perhaps even much easier than that than the equivalent video making for um, for advertising or for um, for other kinds of production. We uh, um, 
um, we're, we're able to to tap into those skills and 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 get people who 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 really had the skills to help us get going. Um, all right. Um, there's another very interesting question around. Um, let me see. Resistance to openness um, with regards to intellectual property. And I think that maybe we can explain a little bit about what happened in our context and why it's important in MOOCs. So um, in our case, um, we suggested to the educators who were making MOOCs that they release their materials under a Creative Commons license. And that means that anybody who accesses that material can then reuse it um, according to the terms of the license. Um, apart from a very a, a few individuals with the first MOOC that we worked with, which had 18 different presenters, and two of the presenters withdrew because they didn't want to do that. But the lead educators were happy to release their license, their materials. Um, in a way, it was easier to persuade them or suggest this to them because it was a MOOC, because they didn't see it as part of, you know, the MOOC was not their core teaching and learning. It wasn't something, it was a sort of extra thing that they were doing. And so they perhaps were less um, concerned uh, about that. Also, up what Andrew said about why they were doing the MOOC in the first MOOC is a different thing. Yes, you want to teach lots of people, but you also, there's, you know, in, in our cases, there, were, there was a reason, um, you know, they either wanted to um, expand their field globally, um, they wanted to work in interdisciplinary contexts, or they wanted to expand the opportunities for professional development for people outside of the university. The offer to um, license their materials as OER aligned with those objectives. And so I think that alignment with purpose um, did help in terms of intellectual property, which might be different if they are writing a book or they're doing something in a different context. So it, it, it partly was the kind of newness of the MOOC environment that um, in all cases meant that we were able to work with them to release most of their materials um, under a Creative Commons license. So some of it was because it sidestepped the um, the kind of, uh, you know, their normal IP approach. Um, also, I suppose the type of people who are willing to make MOOCs might have a more propensity to be open. Um, we thought perhaps, you know, we had already, they'd already self-selected themselves into a group that we just had had a more kind of open outlook to uh, their purpose. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so what what we see, uh, um, so we, what MOOC platforms are trying to do is um, a, allow universities to showcase some of their best teaching and opportunities, and what they're trying to offer is is then. A, a way for the university to then attract people who've done MOOCs to come to the university for more. So a MOOC doesn't necessarily share all of the intellectual property of an academic. It is simply, in this model, seen as a way of showing, well, what would a postgraduate degree in, in this field be like? Um, what are the kind of topics that are taught at this university? Um, are you interested in this field? Um, um, if you wanted some continued education, um, who are the people you could contact? So it, it does have this this other role of being like a taster. It's not the all, all the knowledge and learning of the university. The formal degrees are still in that space. So, so MOOCs are often short and uh, uh, just showcasing some of the features of teaching and learning at the institution. Okay. Um, I think that's a quite, that's quite a nice seg to one of the questions um, in the chat from Ishaya, which I'll read out. He's, um, the question is, will the certificate be accepted globally? Is there any special accreditation for the MOOC courses? How do educators, learners benefit from MOOCs, especially in African countries where resources are scarce? 
Um, so, I don't know if you want to take the certificate um, one, Andrew. Uh, um, so, um, so, so the, the certificates are not like um, degrees, um, and people um, put a lot of their certificates on their LinkedIn and other profiles to show that they continued learning. Um, it, it may or may not help you in a in, in a job application to mention it. Um, what MOOCs have have primarily been used for is for people who uh, um, have some possibly high education qualifications, do not need the other degree, but want to show that they've been involved in continuing education. Um, and, and some professions require people to have have um, done courses um, as part of their professional um, accreditation, and, and MOOCs are used in that space. Um, then MOOCs are now used as ways for doing a MOOC as part of perhaps a postgraduate study or an undergraduate study, but it might just be a small part. So it would be um, before you register for a course, you might um, do the MOOC, show that you can do the material and, and discover for yourself that you're interested in this field um, and then continue into a, a, a program. Um, and people have experimented with other ways of recognizing qualifications. There's another market where um, organizations like governments or, or, um, uh, or companies have internally recognized MOOCs as part of their, their training. Um, and so this is a, 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 an emerging field, um, but there is no universal or global agreement on what these courses mean. You, you, it would have to be negotiated within your organization or your context. Yeah. Um, so, just pick. So, as Andrew said, that this is a really interesting and evolving area. Um, and one additional example is that one of our newest MOOCs, which is the organ donation MOOC, it's called from Organ Donation from Death to Life, which is a course for um, healthcare professionals to be more comfortable about. Um, the whole process of um, deceased organ donation, including all the ethical issues around that, um, has been recently accredited for South African CPD. So although that's not formal credit, it is, as Andrew was saying, another way of making the learning count. Because I think underlying that question is, how can you make the learning count um, if you have invested in a MOOC and a MOOC certificate? And so, um, very few, it, it's not like it's a degree or it's credit, but there are very, very interesting models being um, released around how can you make the learning count. So we're also very interested in hearing about if there are any other models that people know about, um, about, about that. And, and our follow-on research project is, in fact, to research this question about how do people value MOOCs having taken them and our, our initial um, assumption is that that it's in many different ways that a, a, a certificate isn't necessarily required to do that um, but often people have to think well, how how will this benefit me what did I get um, from doing this and and there we're looking at people's transitions we're asking them how did this help you transition and change your life um, or change your opportunities or start doing something differently in your career. Okay, um, we've got just a few more minutes. So, um, Nampilo, I'm going to hand back over to you. Um, and then, it, But if there are any other questions you'd like us to answer, we'd be happy to do so. Okay, hey, thank you, everyone. Um, I see. Sorry, we, I can't hear you. Okay. Oh, there you go. Yeah. She saw me at the University of Zambia. I was asking about how um, they could improve the attention of at the institution. Did um, answer the same. 
Um, I can't hear you. I'm going to see if I can find that question. Still Zambia. Is it about admissions? Or? Sony Mumba. Oh, okay. So I, I'm going to read this out and um, hopefully it's the right question. So Chisoni is saying MOOC has brought a paradigm shift to the teaching and learning. We use Moodle at the University of Zambia, but adoption of this methodology has been very poor, especially among senior colleagues. What can we do to improve the adoption of MOOC pedagogies? Um, I'm going, I'm not sure if that um, question relates to um, the use of online learning within the university generally or whether it relates specifically to MOOCs. Um, so I don't know if Chisoni wants to clarify that, but um, in terms of um, Moodle um, and a learning management system, um, I, in terms of how MOOC pedagogies could help, um, oh, within the university, okay. Um, so so what, what, we were particularly interested in in, in in looking at open educational practices to see how those might um, those same practices might be applied beyond the MOOCs. In other words, also for their potentially their their uh, um, learning management system courses and other other teaching. Um, and uh, um, that, that was one of the things that we were looking out for. We, there, there weren't. Uh, uh, um, there weren't a lot of um, examples which of the transformation that you're hoping for, because um, but but we did see that that um, that, that through um, um, supporting people through creating one course in in this case a MOOC, their ability to ask questions or the ability to um, completely unrelated to the 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 the, the, the MOOC that we created did increase we had many more engagements with them and they they knew had a much better insight how the university support structures work what things they could do and what other possibilities might exist so i would uh, hypothesize that that helping people through uh, um, the design of 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 one course um they would definitely be able to apply that in more contexts, and this is often a, a barrier that that showing people how to do it once really does make a a, um, a difference. Providing a little bit of extra support initially um, really can um, uh, make these educational open education these broadly these educational practices more widely um, adopted. And so that certainly was our our finding. All right, due to um, to Nampilu's uh, sound issues, um, I'm just uh, stepping in here. Uh, we have reached the end of the end of the hour. I'm wondering, um, is there perhaps uh, just one more question we can we can sure. take just before closing the session? I don't have uh, a full overview of the text chat, but perhaps uh, perhaps Sukaina and Andrew, uh, perhaps you've spotted a question that uh, you would like to, to just give a just quick, quick answer to? Yeah, maybe I'll just respond to Adam's comment here, um, where he says, I think MOOCs work better, the MOOCs that work better are those that offer short courses such as a month or some weeks. An example is one used by the Shore Academy where courses are advertised as free but for people to finish the full course, they may have to pay a little fee. So there's two points there. So one of them is around the short course, month or some weeks. And actually, I would, I would agree with that. Um, when MOOCs first started, um, way back in sort of 2012, um, 2013, it tended to be kind of eight to 12 weeks because people were seeing courses as semester courses, you know. And then over time looking at the behavior of people, um, MOOCs became sort of eight to six weeks, and now 
there are many MOOCs that are two, three, four, five weeks, um, which seems to be a kind of a good good amount of time. And the idea is that if you have a pro, uh, you know, more than one topic, that you might make two or three MOOCs that are then stackable. Um, so I think that that does help um, with. Uh, um, student engagement um, because MOOCs are very very different from formal courses people tend to dip in and out their main enemy to completion seems to be time and life gets in the way and because they haven't paid anything um, that often means that even though they'd like to finish they don't so I think yes I agree Adam I think that the short short courses um, seem to work better than very long drawn out things um, and in terms of um, paying a fee, I think um, what, that's one of the arguments that the MOOC platforms are making, is that um, some payment um, does um, assist with um, motivating people to complete. Um, and certainly in terms of the lens of financial openness, um, we have, you know, in a way, many of our educators or um, you know people in the MOOC community are living with the fact that MOOCs are no longer completely free but that there are where you place the paywall and how equitable and fair you can make it is a kind of bit of a dance that people do um, and in fact uh, what one of the reasons that some of our courses are on Coursera um, or as a motivator is because Coursera is one of the MOOC platforms that does offer full financial aid for people who can't pay for the certificate for whatever reason. And, and that has been something that we have heavily advertised for some when we market some of our courses for to particular audiences because we really want them to take the course and apply for financial aid. Okay, um, over back to you, Jakob. All right, thank you so much, uh, Sukaina, and uh, thank you to you, Andrew, as well. Um, I think that we uh, will be closing the sessions uh, now. Uh, I would like to thank, um, once again, uh, Sukaina and Andrew for, for this very interesting and, and topical presentation. Um, also, thank you to um, Nabilo Zuma for, uh, for facilitating this uh, session this afternoon. Just to repeat uh, Tony's message a bit further up, um, this discussion continues. Um, we are using our Facebook event uh, page for, for, for this. Um, perhaps, Tony, maybe you can repost. Yes, you have done that now. Repost the link to the Facebook group. We have a shorthand also, which is emergeafrica.net slash Facebook. Um, do come into the event created for the MOOCs in Africa uh, sessions um, and uh, continue the conversations. Um, an edited version of, uh, of the recording uh, of the session will also be posted right there. Um, and then uh, we welcome you back for our next session in our series, which will happen on Tuesday. Um, and we hope you will be with us and continue the the discussions um, along the next uh, coming uh, webinars as well. From me Thanks. and from the rest of the Emerge Africa team, I would like to wish you all a uh, good afternoon. Uh, and Sukena? Yeah, just to say thank you, everyone, um, very much. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Jakob, for everything you've done as well. That's only a big pleasure. All right, I am closing this uh, session. <laughs>